Welcome to church. My name is Amanda. I'm going to invite you to stand up to your feet and let's give God praise for he is good. Amen. Here we go. Again, a warm welcome and a big shout out to all you who are watching in Squamish, in Arizona, Pitt Meadows, Commercial North Van, Yale Town, Burnaby, all of our campuses, wherever you are in the world, we pray that you experience the power and the presence of God. Well, let's sing out the truth that God loves us so much that he gave his one and only son. Come all you weary, come all you thirsty, come to the way that never runs dry drink of the water come and thirst no more come all you sinners come find his mercy come to the table he will satisfy taste of his goodness find what you're looking for Oh, 
the hope that we have he heals us he restores us we can come to him and he welcomes us with open arms church isn't that such great news well this next song we're going to sing it's a it's a new song based on a familiar chorus i have decided to follow jesus no turning back no turning back the cross before me the world behind me no turning back you know, this, this weekend we celebrated 10 people being baptized. Yeah, let's give God praise for that. And what I love about what it says on the shirts, I have decided. We celebrate those people who went public with their faith. So we're going to teach you this course. Let's sing it together and make this bold declaration. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. Won't change my mind. I will follow you all of my life. The cross before me, my past behind. I will follow you all of my life. Jesus, I believe you are the Son of king to die upon the cross you didn't stay inside that grave no one else has done the same jesus i confess your lord of my life i choose to say yes to your ways not mine no more running no more searching you're the only one for me. Sing that chorus again. No turning back. No turning back. Won't change my mind. I will follow you all of my life. The cross before me. My past behind. I will follow.
you what a declaration we just spoke out what was in our heart Jesus you've revealed yourself to us we decided to follow you you said you would come to seek and save those which are lost you did that in our lives and for those that may be watching listening or present in whether here or one of our campus rooms right now they may be you may be knocking at their heart's door and this may be the day to Jesus that they decide to follow you We've committed no turning back. The world behind us, our past behind us, the cross before us, and beyond the cross is an empty tomb, and beyond the empty tomb is a resurrected Savior, and beyond the resurrected Savior is a soon coming King. We keep our eyes focused on you. We love you, Jesus. Amen. 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 Good to worship together. Thank you. Thank you so much for leading us in a place of worship this morning. For those that are present here or one of our campuses, would you do something? Say hello to somebody. If you know the person that maybe you came with, meet somebody else. For those that are online, of course, we have wonderful hosts that would love to connect with you. Please let us know where you are watching from. And uh, we we spoke with someone recently, or you spoke with someone from Hong Kong. We give shout-outs everywhere. We have our campus shout-outs. Uh, we have our microsite shout-outs. Mm. But, you know, there are groups of, of people coming together and watch parties uh, really all over the world. So maybe you are in Hong Kong, UK. We love, we see you. I, we know that there's some gathering together in UK as well as some other parts Manitoba. of Canada. Manitoba. <laughs> Manitoba. Yeah. Yep. Hello, Plum Cooley. <laughs> if I if I was decent in my low German, I would say something, but I don't dare go there. But yeah, I should know that because that's where that's where my grandmother was raised was in Plum Cooley, and I can hear her speaking that language, but I can't do it. Can't quite articulate that. No. No. That's no. all right. But that's okay. I think you understand me in English, so hopefully. It's just good wherever you're watching from. And it's so good to be in church together. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And uh, love 
love being in uh, just a place of worship. When right. you come into his presence, the Bible says, with thanksgiving, which is what we did today. We came into his presence with thanksgiving. And to be able to declare something of who he is, mm -hmm. he is not only Lord, as we sang, but he's also our Lord. And uh, to do that one another with brothers and sisters in Christ, it's, it's, uh, it's solidifying for our faith. It is. Yeah. We had a highlight yesterday, everybody, 10 people water baptized, as was mentioned, down at uh, English Bay. I have a couple of pictures we'll put up for you. Pastor Fari and the team were down there, and uh, as you see on those T-shirts, I have decided, we just saying that, decide to follow Jesus. And Ethan, one of the fellows that was baptized, you'll hear his story in just a little bit. But this is the day that we go, we go public with our faith, where we say, you know what, I have decided. Uh, my old life is left in the water. I'm a new person through Christ, and uh, we get to celebrate it. So a lot of life happening down at the beach. When you gather 10 people plus a crowd watching them, everybody else on the beach perks up and goes, what in the world is going on? Uh, one, one person once said to me, you guys still do that? I didn't know they still did that. <laughs> but yes, we still baptize people. And... Uh, <laughs> Of course, we are not the only ones. Baptism is happening across our city, all kinds of wonderful good churches in Vancouver. Yes. We're just one of a number of wonderful churches in our city. That, and we're thankful to have people saying, I, I have decided to follow Jesus. Right. He changed my life. My old life is staying in the water. And by the power of our Lord, I'm coming out a new person. So big shout out to all those who are water baptized. And if you'd like to be water baptized, let us know. We do it once a month here downtown. We also have it at our campuses. And we will find a way to help you in that step. It might not be possible for you to go to the beach. We understand that. We'll work with you to make that happen. So uh, a lot of times our baptisms come through our small groups, through our life groups. And this is where we connect throughout the week. This is where we laugh together, we cry together, we pray together, we eat together, we do life together. I talked to somebody today, and right after this service, they were going down to the park. Another life group I know is having a picnic today. And, you know, you're meant for a community. You are not meant to be by yourself. And you're meant to have others pray with you, gather with you. And so we'd love to help you with this. If you're not in a small group, one of our campuses, let your leader know there. If you're online, we can connect you to an online group. If you're here with us this morning in our... Uh, 1160 West Georgia site, downstairs after the service, Pastor Brad, who is helping lead worship, he'll be there, help you get connected to a small group. As we often say here, don't be lonely in the city. Uh, have some friends, have people pray for you, go to bat for you, celebrate with you. So that's happening afterwards downstairs. Love to have you do that. Another thing that's happening afterwards is our Connect course. Yes. Our Connect course is happening at 1230. And uh, to just following this service across the street, uh, downtown, across the street at right. Alberni Street, our office is there. And basically what the Connect course is, if you're new to Coastal and you want more information about the church, we would love to connect with you there, as well as if you have been coming for a while. And, and a number of, of you have been coming since COVID. And now that we're back together in person, there is a place to connect one with another yeah. and also a place to serve. There are many opportunities to serve. You're going to hear that in a testimony in just a moment. There are many opportunities to serve. And there is something, and if you've served in, whether it's at Coastal or maybe you've just moved here and you served at your previous church, there is something about serving, about mm. saying yes. And so if you would like to be a part of that, we would love to meet you across the street. You'll also hear about our campuses, yep. about our campuses as well. Every one of our campuses gladly meet with someone at the desk following the service. And, you know, uh, another thing, especially during the summer, I'm just, just a little... Heads up, all of our campuses have air conditioning with the exception of downtown. <laughs> Just saying. You guys, enjoy your air conditioning. We are not envious. We bless you. <laughs> While we fan ourselves here, we're really happy for you. So you just know if it's really hot and it's like, man, there's a Sunday, it's really hot, just you can just go visit one of our campuses and it's, um, it's a, there's an amazing temp. There you in go. All of those yeah. places. Wow, that's a good little... A good little coastal church hack right yep, there. That's there it. you go. Say, another thing to connect with, we announced this earlier, but just to make mention again, as you know, we have given into the work in Ukraine. We're helping that there. And uh, it's good to see God answering prayers, that the situation continues to be, um, well, you know the news. I don't have to tell you. 
But here's the deal. People are moving to Vancouver from the Ukraine. We have pe people that are arriving in our congregation and then others that are arriving. And they don't have a place to settle. They're new. They're refugees. Some of them don't speak uh, English. And so Saturday, July 16th, next Saturday at 630, at our commercial site, not this site, but commercial campus, we're going to be doing um, an interest meeting. So there's people who are saying, how do we gather? How do we meet? How do we worship together? How can we meet together in the city? So yes, we want to help them in Ukraine, working with our church friends there in Sweden, but also what can we do in our own city to help these people? And so that's Saturday, July 16th. If you know somebody that this would apply to, meet us there, and we'll, we'll, we'll go from there. We'll, have, we'll plan and listen and uh, see how the best way we can serve these that are arriving in our city and help make the city a better place, as we often say. Well, there's a lot of things we could announce yet. Of course, Regen's coming up July 21. For all you young adults, you'll want to be there for that. That's coming up not this Thursday, but the following Thursday. And all that to say, let, let's continue to give into what God's doing. You know, here's what Jesus had to say. He said, do not, do not, do not store for yourself treasure on earth, where moth and rust destroy, and where thieves break in and steal. He said, store for yourself treasure in heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroy, and where no thief breaks in and steals. You know, your investment in heaven, you never have to worry about it going down. If you invest in the stock market, you might wake up one morning and say, oh dear, I lost a lot of money this morning. And if you bought Bitcoin last September, you might be wondering, what happened to all my money? But when you invest into heaven, it's good for all eternity. He said, well, how do I invest into heaven? by serving, by helping others, but also by our giving. God takes note on how we give. And what, well, it's said, where does the giving go? He sum it up this way, it goes into changed lives, uh, whether it be through our children, through our youth, through Regen, through, through our life groups, through having campuses, having facilities to meet, all of that. But at the end of the day, it's changed lives. So here's a story of a changed life. Way to give, you can do that online. You can scan the code. You know the deal. You can get online, website. But let, let's, let's give into something for eternity. And uh, here's, here's a life that's been changed because of your giving. This is a young man. You'll enjoy Ethan's story. Right after that, I'm back with a message. My name's Ethan, and I was born in Australia. But when I was eight, I moved over to Vancouver with my family. Growing up, I've always gone to a Christian school. Then in 2020, I went to university and it was my first experience being out of that sort of environment. What surprised me most about my new friend at school was that they were kind of just all right with living life for themselves, just trying to find fun. As soon as I emerged myself with mostly non-believing friends in my community, I, I felt the longing for people of the same spirits, of the same mind. As I've been coming to Coastal for around about a decade now. I've always looked forward to finally coming of age and being able to join Regen and, and meet new people of the same age, the same path and faith and going to the same church. And then as soon as pandemic started, I mean, it was kind of a confusing time for all of us. So Regen, I didn't instantly go to Regen as soon as I turned 19. I was doubting whether it was like, it was worth it. And also I was, I was waiting on others if they might want to go with me. And I, I didn't really want to go on, go on my own, but Soon enough, I was just like, no, it's all right, I'll try it. I just head on up and see how it's like, and it didn't disappoint, it was great. I was a little bit nervous, I was kind of like, because whenever you go to somewhere new, you're kind of like, what do I, what impression do I want to set? What do I, what do I want to wear? What do I want to act like or whatever? But at Regen, I found it was just best to just be yourself. I had no idea there were so many people of the same faith and the same age who were, who were like equally hungry for the Word of God. As church started to open up again, I knew I kind of wanted to get involved. I found once I started going to Regen, Ali would reach out and ask me if I wanted to do something, and I didn't know how to do much, but I did know how to say yes. So as soon as she got me in contact with the media leader, I was like, maybe I can use my business experience to do some administrative work for the church. But he was like, would you mind just joining the media team? And I didn't know how to operate a camera. I didn't know how to operate the switchboard. I didn't know how to do anything media-wise, but I did know how to say yes. So I started going and they told me everything I needed to know. I was able to make a difference in my church community, which feels totally different from just being a part of it and taking it in, but also giving back to you what little it is. It's been, it's been awesome. 
there was a moment when I made the choice to start serving and I did start serving and then I came to church one Sunday. I felt like I could say, yeah, I want this for my life. I, like, I want this. Not because my parents want it, not because my role models want this for me or my friends want it, but because like, I want it. I want the relationship. I want to have faith and to want that, that's a feeling like none other. It's like you're accepting the Father in your life. All right, great. Thanks again, Ethan, for sharing your story, and congratulations on being baptized yesterday. What a great uh, day that was for you. Well, if you're watching today online or at one of our campuses, I encourage you, if you haven't already done so, you want to uh, download the, the Coastal Church app because the notes are on there, lots to cover, and this is an easy way for you to stay updated. There's also a blog that comes out every week. Pastor Karen's written a great blog that ties in with this message. There's other material there. So it's easy to do. Get online, download the app, and then away you go. So... Once again, we're going to be going through the story, and if you've been following along with us, it's, uh, this is what it looks like if you were to buy the book, or you can listen to it online as well. It's a little bit different than a regular Bible. The regular Bible has 66 books in it, and they're not in chronological order. The nice thing about the story is it's chronological. So you start in the book of Genesis, and you go all the way over to the book of Revelation, and the deal is it gives you the, the big picture and it just how it all comes together. So we encourage you, if you have not done so, uh, you can pick up. Today's a good spot to pick up. We're in chapter 22, and we're going to be talking about, uh, really, we're entering into the New Testament. And so we've been through the Old Testament. Last week, if you're here with us, we were in the book of Nehemiah. We are talking about how Nehemiah was this incredible leader, why we need leadership today. We talked a little bit about a prophet named Malachi, and that was the end of the Old Testament. There was a period of silence for about 400 years. There was no prophets. We didn't read of any miracles happening. And God wasn't absent, but there was this transition coming as Jesus was about to come to earth. And so this is where we're at today is this pivotal, pivotal point really in not only our story, but a pivotal point in history. Every time you write a date, if I write 2022, it's after his death and everything before that. So it really was uh, the pinnacle, so to speak, or the apex, or if you're a Canadian, we might say it was center ice. That was the center or focal point. All the things we had talked about in the Old Testament we're pointing to, right from Genesis already, was pointing to this arrival of the Christ, of the Messiah. And so that's where we're at today. It's an exciting place to be, him arriving just at the right time in a magnificent way, but yet in an unspectacular way. You know the story. He came as a babe in a manger. There was no big procession to announce the arrival of the king. Joseph and Mary knew. Joseph, a blue-collar carpenter. Mary was a teenager. They had an idea what was happening. But for the rest of the world, they didn't really understand. As we look at the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, Matthew and Mark and Luke, they give the account of the genealogy of Jesus. They give the account of the shepherds coming, the wise men coming, the babe wrapped in a manger, but we're going to look at John's account today as we dive into this Christmas message. Yes, this is a Christmas message on, in July. So would you look at your neighbor at our campuses online here this morning? Would you look at your neighbor and say, Merry Christmas? Come on, just <laughs> give him a big smile and say, Merry Christmas. <laughs> Merry Christmas. Come on, Bernie. I can hear you there in that wonderful theater. You know the theater, you're talking about this theater, you know, where they have air conditioning. Not only does Burnaby have air conditioning, the chairs lift up and they're heated seats if you want it. <laughs> Can you imagine going to church and having a heated seat and air conditioning? Anyhow, that's just too much. You guys are, but our, we have meet in different sites and often use theaters or schools. And so there you go. Uh, all that to say, we're in the book of John. So you say with me this morning, thank you, Lord for the book of John. We're going to use his account in the upper story. Of course, this is now everything's coming together. 
The Messiah, the Christ, has finally arrived. What's been promised to Abraham, to David, all the prophecies, now is coming to this point about God's upper story intersecting the lower story at the birth of Jesus Christ, the God-man, God who took on flesh for us. So in John's gospel, there's some things that he starts with right away, and he's, he's giving us some keys, some ways that we as readers can incorporate this power of God into our lives. So I'll talk about a few this morning, and each one of these could be a year's worth of messages, but we'll talk about Jesus is the Word, Jesus is the light, and Jesus is the truth. John covers that right off here in his first chapter. So first of all, Jesus is the Word. What does that mean? John chapter 1, verses 1 to 3, we read this. In the beginning was the Word. So right away, this takes us to the book of Genesis, correct? Because in the beginning, God said that there be what? Light. So the first thing he said was saying, if I'm saying something, I'm using words, correct? So just track with me. It's, it's, it's in the beginning was the word. In the beginning, something was said. In the beginning was the word. And the word was with God, and the word was God. All things were made through him. Without him, nothing was made that was made. What, what's, what's John talking about here? What, what is this, in the beginning was the Word? And uh, now, if you were reading this book, when John first wrote it, primarily to an audience that spoke Greek. That's the language of the day, was Greek. And of course, his audience were Jews, so they would have spoken a Jewish their language as well. But they all understood Greek. So the word that he uses for word is logos. Logos, it's an interesting word, and in our English language, we have a hard time wrapping our heads around it because we have one word for word. The Greeks had different words for that. You remember the word love? They had different words for love. And the same thing with this word word. They have this logos is the way they used it. Now, logos is an interesting word because logos meant to them divine uh, intelligence or some, there was something behind it. So when he's saying word, they were thinking of something much more. They, they felt it was like divine enlightenment. We might say intelligent design. So that's what logos is. The, the Stoic philosophers of the day, they defined logos as an active, rational, and spiritual principle that permeated all reality. This is a really important point, and you kind of have to wrap your head around this if you want to get the rest. So you have to do a little bit of deep thinking this morning that, that it's not just word, it's there's a divine force, there's a divine principle that is at work. And so John intentionally uses logos to get their attention. They were asking the same questions back then that people ask today, big life questions. For instance, they would ask, why do the pieces of the universe fit together so intricately? If there isn't a higher standard outside the natural world ordering the way things work, then why do they work so well? Or they would ask the question, why do we have a strong desire for purpose and meaning in life? If there's no big picture, no divine force at work that explains where we came from, why we're here, why do we ask questions about purpose and spend our life trying to find these answers? So these are questions that the philosophers were asking then, and we're still asking that question today. There's something referred to as the anthropic principle in science, and this is where we say that the universe appears, they say, to be fine-tuned for our existence. So there, there's something, a place at work that put everything in order. There, there was something before light was, or something before all this universe came into place. Something was at work, and that, that's tied into this word logos. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. If you, if you, for example, if we could take an electron microscope and we could look down to the smallest, smallest particles, if we look down to, let's say, to a proton, for example. Protons are those positively charged uh, subatomic particles along with neutrons that form the nucleus of an atom. And they, they just happen to be, protons just happen to be 1,836 times larger than electrons. Now, if they were any bigger or any smaller, 
it would collapse. Molecules would collapse. So is it by luck, by chance, that they're exactly the right size, or did somebody design it that way? Now, that's on the smaller level. But now if we went into the big picture, and if we looked at our Earth being just the right distance from the sun, having just the right magnetic pull, the right distance from the moon, the right mixture of gases, the right amount of water on the planet, you can see in the big picture and then the minute details, you see there must have been a force. There must have been a design behind all this. I read somewhere that scientists, when they're exploring something new, if it doesn't have a beautiful pattern, they know they're on the wrong track because there's usually a beautiful pattern to it. And, you, and we see these patterns all around us. Nature speaks of a creator, of a force, of a logos that was at work. So this is the way John starts it off. He said there's this word, this logos. In Hebrews, I'll put a verse out of Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12 on the screen for you, talking about God's word. It says, God's word is a live and powerful exclamation mark. God's word is alive and powerful. It is sharper than any double-edged sword. That means there's other double-edged swords out there because it's sharper than the others. The Bible talks about other double-edged swords, a, a word of a perverted person, etc. So double-edged sword, his word can cut through our spirits and souls, through our joints and marrows, and until it discovers the desires and thoughts of our hearts. So breakdown. Let's break down this verse for a bit. First of all, God's word is alive and powerful. Another translation says it's full of energy. It's full of logos. There's this divine force in his word. Then he says his word is sharper than any double-edged sword. This is an interesting word. I'm no Greek scholar by any means. But if you look it up and find out what it means, double-edged is die for two, stomas. Two edge, or the root of that word is two mouthed. So you can read it this way. His word is sharper than any two mouthed sword. What does that mean? What are the two mouths? Now stay with me for a bit. God spoke at once. Who should speak at the second time? Me. We do. When does his word become alive and powerful in your life? When you speak it. Otherwise, you can have a Bible sitting on your coffee table. You can take and download a Bible app and have a hundred translations. But how many know it's full of power, but it's not changing your life? When does it change your life? When you speak it out of your mouth. So it's a two-edged sword. It has to be spoken out of your mouth. Now, it says here, his word can cut through our spirits and souls. It can get right down into the very inner part of you. Here's what will happen. I'll, I'll preach a message. And somebody will say, Pastor, how did you know that was just for me? And, I say, and I'll say, well, that, that was the Holy Spirit. That wasn't me. I, I'm just the water bottle. I'm just a cracked up water bottle. That's what I am. It's the living water. It's the Holy Spirit who addressed it to you. And somebody else will say, that was just for me. It was, who was doing the work? It wasn't me. It was the Holy Spirit, what, cutting through joint and marrow. He was the one that got right in between there and made the word apply right to your context. Because it's living, it's alive. And then it says, it discovers the desires and thoughts of your heart. If you're watching on our campuses today, maybe you're there at Pitt Meadows, maybe you're watching at Richmond, and you say, these are my desires. I, I have a need, There's, and I'm thinking about this. What are you thinking about this morning? What are your desires? Where do you need God involved in your life right now? Where do you need him involved? I desire a better marriage. I desire to be able to pay my bills. Interest rates going up at the end of the month. My paycheck's all spent. I, I have a desire for that. So there's, there's needs, and then there's, there's this powerful word. So the question is, how do we make them meet? How do we connect? How do we connect it together? How do I apply today's message into my life? Let me give you an illustration that, that might help you with this. So when I grew up, one of my favorite toys was Hot Wheels. Anybody else have Hot Wheels? 
All right, there's a few Hot Wheel lovers out there. I should have kept them because they're worth a lot of money these days. And so I have a, we had a track like this, a Hot Wheel track. And we had this little clamp. You put it on a desk or something. And you can see the Hot Wheel cars up in this, up in this little uh, uh, gate there. And then you, you press the button. And then the Hot Wheels would race down the track. And you jump off. Yay, my car won. And, and this, is, this is Hot Wheels. Right about now you're saying, preacher, what in the world does this have to do with John chapter 1? I'm glad you asked. I have, a question. I have an answer for you. All right. So these Hot Wheels sitting at the top of the track here, they have what we call in physics potential energy. How, potential energy is based on how high it is, the mass of the cars, and the force of gravity. So they have potential energy. What happens is I press the button... The gate opens, and whoosh, down they go. When they leave and they're in motion, it changes from potential energy to kinetic energy. Now the energy is part of mass and velocity. There's action involved. Here's the analogy. This is God's Word right now. It's right here. It is potential energy. It's full of power. It's full of life. What we want to do is open the gate so that power is released and changes the situation in my life. So the question is, well, how do I open the gate? How do I do this? I'm glad you asked that question. Here we go. First of all, you have to find God's promises. God can't bless laziness. you got to get in there, dig in his word, and find it. You have to open the book. You have to study it and find it. So let's say you have a situation where maybe you're not making ends meet. Your bills aren't getting paid. And you say, oh, God, I don't know if I'm going to be able to buy clothes this week. Or I, got, I have three children. I need to get some clothes for them. But we're just out of money. And they're going back to school. And, and you're, you're really wrestling with that. How do I go from this promise to having it released in my life? Let me make it very simple. Number one, ask. Jesus said, ask and you shall receive that your joy may be full. He said, you have not because you ask not. He who asks, receive. He who seeks, find. He who knocks, the door shall be opened. There's a lot of verses, and the onus is on us is to ask. What, what activates this promise, what releases it from potential to kinetic, is us honoring God, valuing Him, trusting His Word, putting our faith in it, and saying, God, I'm asking. I'm not too proud to ask. I'm specifically asking in the name of Jesus. And so I ask you. So that, that releases it from being potential to being kinetic. The second thing that is so important is what you're saying. Let me read from the words in red in Matthew chapter 6. Here's what he says. Which of you by worrying can add one cubic to a stature? What are you saying? Which of you by worrying can add one hour to your life? Let me just quickly scan the audience here. If your worrying gives you more time on your clock, could I please see your hand? All right, see no hands. Any hands online? I don't know. But wouldn't you agree? Jesus is right. Worrying doesn't add any time on our clock. Right? So he says, which of you can do that? Nobody can do it. It's a rhetorical question. Then he goes on to say, so why do you worry about clothing? Or why do you worry about having your bills paid? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. And yet I say to you that even Solomon, all his glory, was not arrayed like one of these. Now if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is, and tomorrow is thrown in the oven, his force, his life, his energy is caring for all of that, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Faith is asking. Faith is believing, trusting. Now watch what he says in verse 31. Therefore, do not worry saying, do not worry saying. What keeps the promises kind of locked behind the gate is when we're worrying and we're speaking negative doubt, unbelief, speaking the problem instead of speaking the answer. He says, do not worry saying, what should we eat? What should we drink? How should I pay my bills? What should we wear? He says, for all these things the Gentiles seek, your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. But seek first his kingdom, his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. They'll go from potential to kinetic when you ask. 
Why? Because there's power in this word. There's logos here. Are you guys still tracking with me or are you just thinking deeply? There's power in the truth of God's word. Wow. So that's number one. Paul, John gets us started on that. And then the second thing he says is Jesus is light. Jesus is the word and Jesus is light. And another bold claim. It's a, only a claim a God can make. In John chapter 1, verse 4 and 5, it says, In him was life. He's the source of life. The life was the light of men. Light shines in the darkness. The darkness did not comprehend it, can't overpower it. This was the true light, which gives light to every man, every person coming into the world. It's for everybody. Now, we have an enemy, and his objective is to put a veil in front of you, or if you're speaking of a camera, to have a shutter in front of you. You know the way a camera works. When the shutter opens, the light hits the film. And what our enemy wants to do, Paul says, he wants to blind you. He wants to put a shutter over your spiritual eyes. Even though the image of Jesus is right there, you can't see it because there's this veil. What happens is we pray and say, enemy, you can't do that for my friends, my loved ones. It lifts it. And when it lifts it, you go, ha, huh? wow, Jesus, you're fantastic. I love you. Wow. You are the lily of the valley. You're the bright morning star. You're my savior. You're pure. You're lovely. You're true. Oh, I embrace you. But a veil, a shutter is what the enemy wants nobody to see the beautiful Jesus because he's light and he brings the image of himself into our hearts. This light is so important, so powerful. Mm. You know, on our planet, when it's dark, we have something called the moon at nighttime. If you walk out on a nice moonlit night, you can see a lot. You can make your way around. Now, is the moon the source of light? Of course not. We know the sun is a source of light. It's just positioned to reflect light onto the planet. And what God's asking us to do as Christians, how do I apply this message? We need to position ourselves in front of the Lord that his light comes upon us and his light is reflected to a broken world around us. For many people, you're the only light they're going to see. They're going to see Jesus reflected in you by the way you conduct yourself, by the fruit in your life. And he said, you are the salt. You're the light. Don't put a basket over it. Position yourself in front of me. All right, now I'm standing in front of this floodlight. There's more light on me, because, but I have to position myself here. If I walk behind the screen, I hide out back here. Hi, you can't see me. <laughs> this, this is what some Christians do. You know, I'm just going to hide back here. No, no. He said, let your light shine. This little light of mine. Remember that song? I'm going to let it shine. Cheryl's going to sing that in overtime for you. <laughs> we haven't had a song for a long time. This little light of mine. I'm going to let it shine. So he was the light, and we're called to reflect the light. So much more could be said about that. John 12, 46, he said, I've come as a light to shine in this dark world so that all who put their trust in me will no longer remain in the dark. How many of us today have friends that are in darkness, that are in addiction, that are in brokenness, that are struggling with hurts and pains? What's the answer? Jesus. How are they going to find him if we reflect him? Don't go hide behind the screen. You say, well, how would I do that? You know when we do that is when a conversation comes up, the need comes up, and all of a sudden we zip our lip and we don't talk about the answer. Even just saying, can I pray for you, is a reflection of light. Even just saying, God loves you. I love you. Love is, is light. Okay, number three, Jesus is the truth. In 114, John writes, the word became flesh. What does that mean? God, Jesus, the word, this divine force, energy, whatever you want to call it, God, he put on an earth suit. He put on a body, and he dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, his manifested presence. The glory as the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. And can I just remind you again, as you share your faith in the light of God with others, make sure you don't just give them truth. Have them grace as well. Aren't you glad God was gracious to you? Aren't you? He cut you some slack. He said, you know what? I know you don't have it all together yet, but I still love you. I'm still welcoming you. So we have grace and truth. 
I'm going to put a picture of a fish on the screen for you here this morning. See this little guy down here? I don't know what he's thinking, but my thought is his facial expression is, what's happening up there? Am I okay? Am I safe? You can just see, I, I see some, you know, he's alert, a little concerned. And it reminds me of what Philip Yancey wrote in his book, The Jesus I Never Knew. Here's what he writes. I learned about incarnation when I kept a saltwater aquarium. Management of a marine aquarium, I discovered, is no easy task. I had to run a portable chemical laboratory to monitor the nitrate levels and ammonia content. I pumped in vitamins and antibiotics and sulfur drugs and enough enzymes to make a rock grow. I filtered the water through glass fibers, charcoal, exposed it to ultraviolet light. You would think, in the view of all the energy expended on their behalf, that my fish would be at least grateful. Not so. Every time my shadow loomed above the tank, they dove for the nearest shell or coral. They showed me one emotion only, fear. Although I opened the lid and dropped in food on a regular schedule three times a day, they responded to each visit as a sure sign of my design to torture, their, torture them. I could not convince them of my true concern. To my fish, I was deity. I was too large for them. My actions too incomprehensible. My acts of mercy, they saw as cruelty. My attempts at healing, they viewed as destruction. To change their perceptions, I began to see I would need to acquire a form of incarnation. I would have to become a fish and speak to them in a language they could understand. That's, my friend, what Jesus did for us. He came to earth. God loved the world that he sent a son. Why? That we could understand what God was like and ultimately that he'd pay the sacrifice for our sins that we could be made whole. Amen. Yeah, let's thank him for that. Paul, John says he is the truth. And you know the verse John 14, 6, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the truth. What a bold statement. I am the truth. Lots of truths out there. I have my truth, relative truth, etc. But this is the absolute truth. No one comes to the Father except through me. So he made that declaration. And you know John chapter 8, 31 and 32. Then Jesus said to those who believe in him, the Jews, if you abide in my word, just take note of that for a bit. Read that carefully. If, it starts with this word if, so that means not everybody does this, but if as a follower of the Lord... You abide in my word, you're saying it, you're connecting it, you're releasing it from its potential power to its kinetic power, you're my disciples indeed. And you will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. So that, that tells us something. What is the end that Jesus has in mind for you and I? To be free. That's where he wants you to end up. How do we do that? Abide in his truth. See, look at this verse. You shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. We often say, and the truth shall set you free. But you need the first part of that verse. You have to know the truth. You have to abide in the vine. You have to meditate on it, speak it, say it, ask God's word, trust it. And that leads to you being made free. Jesus said, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. This podium is going to pass away. Vancouver is going to pass away. Heaven and earth will pass away. The Lord declares that. But he said, my word is eternal. Why? Because as John writes, it existed before there was light even. He said, word said, let there be light. The word always was. This divine logos always was. He said, heaven and earth will pass away. But my word, always be there. So what does that mean for us? Practically, you can trust God's word in an ever-changing more perilous, more complicated, more crazy world, trust God's word. God, I'm going to trust your word. We have an anchor that keeps us day. Yeah, let's thank him for his word. He, he would like that. God, we thank you for your word. Well, I have to say all of this requires a response. John 1 verse 12, here again, John's introducing this first chapter, but look what he says. There's a lot of meat in this chapter, but here he says in verse 12, now, follow carefully what he's saying here. But to all who believed him, believed, the first verb here, believed, and what? 
accepted, okay, I, I hear you there, out there in, in Pitt Meadows, accepted him, he gave the right to become children of God. So let's make a real simple math formula out of this, okay? Believe plus accept equals what? Child of God. How do you become a child of God? A, believe, to accept. What happens if you just believe? Are you a child of God? You have to accept. He requires your volition. He requires your choice. If you came to Canada and you said, I believe Canada is a good country. I want to be a Canadian citizen. I believe Canada is good. I believe we have a good capital in Ottawa. I believe we have a 49th parallel. We have an Arctic Ocean. And, and I've looked through the material. And, and today I want to become a Canadian citizen. And you go to your swearing in. They say, do you believe what you read about Canada? I go, yes, I believe it. Okay, follow. And now you have to make an, a, 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 an oath. You have to speak some words. He said, no, I'm not going to do that. The judge would say, well, you can't become a Canadian citizen. You have not accepted it until you spoke it. Well, I'm not going to speak it. I'm just going to believe it. They say, well, uh, you can come back in a few more years and give it another try, but that's the way it works. You have to say it. See, when you, the Bible says, I believed and therefore I spoke. Whoever will believe in his heart and what? Confess with his mouth shall be saved. Same thing in this verse. Don't you be stubborn. Don't be, oh, no, I don't have to do that. Everybody who becomes a Canadian citizen gets it. And if you want to be born again of the Spirit of God, it's not enough to say, I believe there's a God, I believe there's a Jesus, I believe there's a Bible. No, you have to open up your heart and say, I accept you. I want to be a child of God. Come into my life. You have to make that choice. Is there, would there might there be a price to pay to be a Christian? Yes. Might there be more persecution today than there was 20 years ago? Yes. May your friends think you might be strange? Yes. But this is truth. This is the real deal. That's why John's saying, I'm writing this so you can believe you get a bigger picture that I have always been there and I will take that, that potential energy and power and I will put that into your life and you're going to be free. Is it going to make you popular? Not necessarily. Is it all your friends and family going to understand? Not right away, but it will change you. You will be born again on the inside. You know what Corey Ten Boone said? If Jesus were born 1,000 times in Bethlehem and not in me, I would still be lost. I'd still be in bondage. So we're at that place right now in the service where you can, you believe this is your moment to accept. This is the time right now it's a Kairos moment. It's a divine moment where that gate's going to open and the power of God will flood into your heart. But you need to pray and you need to ask him to come in your life. So at our campuses online here this morning, let's pray together. I'm inviting you to pray with me this morning. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, this Sunday morning, I open up my heart. I believe that Jesus Christ is God, is the Son of God, who died for my sins and rose again that I could be free, that I could have life. Today I accept you. I want to be a child of God. So I welcome you to come into my life. Amen. If you prayed that with us today, very easy to respond online. We have people there waiting. Just let us know if you prayed that. Welcome to God's family. For one of our campuses, we'd love to help you, meet with you after the service. Let us know if you're here this morning. We'll gladly pray with you after the service. Just stay where you're seated and let us know. By the way, Pastor Brad will be downstairs after the service, and he'd love to connect you with a small group. Maybe you've got questions. That's a good place to meet him, especially what do I do next. We're going to respond in a song of worship. And then after that, Pastor Fari, Pastor Cheryl, they'll, they'll say, okay, how do we take this message applied into our lives today? So, Pastor Brad, let's go. What a great message. Thank you, Pastor Dave. Let's stand and sing.
are glad that you are the light of heaven and that you revealed that light to us, that you've removed that darkness, that filter. It's no longer there. We see you, beautiful Jesus, and we worship you. Amen. Amen. If you want an opportunity to give and you're watching online, this is a good time to do that. And you'll see a QR code that is on the screen or possibly at one of the campuses or even here in person. I'm going to turn it over to the campus ministers right now that you have an opportunity to go through overtime uh, at your own campus, your own microsite. For those that are here, I'm just going to invite you to sit down. Pastor Fari, what an interesting mm -hmm. opportunity to talk about God, Jesus being I'll the be light the and being the... Uh, We'll just let everyone leave that has to leave. It's kind of awkward when you're talking. <laughs> when you're talking and it's like half the people leave, you don't want to listen to us. Um, <laughs> it is kind of an odd feeling. They'll you know? watch the recording later, <laughs> yeah. right? Right, that's what it is. But it's such a good message um, on, on who Jesus is. And, you know, one of the things that... Uh, <laughs> one, <laughs> you're still laughing at me. Yeah. Uh, one of the things that someone gave us a number of years ago, that word, just that one verse, you shall know the truth and the truth shall set you or make you free. That freedom that Jesus gave us, it's like, to be able to walk in freedom in today's world, in our circumstances, what does that actually mean? To walk in freedom, to not have the burden not only of our sin, of our past, but not to have the burden of anxiety and pressure and despondency and everything else. Jesus wants us to be free from all of that. A number of years ago, um, someone, you can see it's a number of years ago. I'm not sure if you can see that online. There's a really old book that we've lost the cover of. Uh, but there, one of the, the, it's a book of prayer with using scripture. And listening to this message this weekend, I pulled this out again, and to be very practical, because we want to be practical, that's why overtime is here, practical, how do we apply that to our lives? It's recognizing that I can say this every day, in Jesus, you are changing my life, your word the refreshing, the regeneration of your word in my life is actually transforming me. And part of this uh, daily confession, um, I, I confess, I don't do this every day, but there was a season of many years that we used this book every single day. And it starts off by saying this, Father, in the name of Jesus, I commit myself to walk in the word. Your word living in me produces your life in this world. I recognize that your word is integrity itself, steadfast, sure, eternal. I trust my life to its provisions. It goes on to say a number of other things, but it says, I delight myself in you and your word. And because of it, you put your desires within my heart. I commit my way to you and you bring it to pass. I'm confident that you are working me now both to will and to do your good pleasure. I exalt your word. I hold it in high esteem. I give it first place. I make my schedule around your word. And you know, when you declare that over your life every day or on a regular basis, the power of that two-edged sword God being speak, speaking at one time and then us speaking, it becomes active and it's sharper. It's those, it's those Hot Wheels cars when you, when you confess this. You come to, you know, we, we sit under the word, but we speak the word. It's so powerful, isn't it? It is, and it, it washes our minds. It cleanses us from any lies that have taken root. Um, any way that we perhaps see our lives, our spouse, our family, uh, workplace, whatever is going on and wherever we find ourselves, there'll be things that God needs to deal with. And his word does that. And um, as you pray the word, as you speak the word, you're reminded of the word. And then the word will reveal things to you, right? It would it will almost be like a mirror as well. Yes. Where it will show you things that you need to change or things that need to be changed uh, that's in you. And then Again, the Holy Spirit will give you the strength to surrender that at that point as you're speaking it, as you're praying, as you're surrendering. You know, one, one thing with, in re regards to that, and you certainly do this, the freedom that comes with the word. 
and the, you know, how God you know, opens up your eyes to see things is don't you find you're more teachable? You're very teachable. I think as when God, Jesus as the light and as the word, you, you ask for others to even come show me, speak into my life, help yeah. me grow. Yeah, and there's a softening that takes place, right? When you become a Christian, um, you're hopefully, <laughs> you're no longer <laughs> stiff-necked. Um, like the Bible talks about how the, um, the people of Israel used to, a lot of time used to be stiff necked and they, they had a hard hardness. How to would them, you, how would you physically do that? Stiff necked. Yeah. You have a hard time turning. <laughs> um, and so you're, you're not led easily by God, but, uh, when you become a Christian, really what happens, your heart is softened towards God. And then the spirit of God is moving in you working through you and you keep surrendering you become teachable obviously to, to God to teach you to change you because if you're not teachable you it's also there's it's hard to change uh, if you don't accept what God has for you what he's revealing to you that needs to be changed uh, you, it's going to take a lot of hard work and I think what happens then people go around the same mountain over and over again yeah struggle with the same things so best to surrender now and say God help me Soften my heart so I don't have to do this thing over and over again. And so that's, I think that's huge. You know, when Pastor Dave went behind the stage, it, it not only uh, hide, you know, don't hide it under a bushel. There's that, this little light of mine. Is that the song that you had mentioned that I'm going to sing? sing? It, yeah. yeah. Uh, this little light of mine. It, it's, it's one of the verses. I'm going to let it. <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> I'm not going there, no. That's the closest we've ever gotten to hearing him sing right there. I'm impressed. I'm really impressed. It's a great, I'm sure that most people, or you heard that when you were a child, or you could, you teach it to your children. This little light of mine. It's one of the first songs that you teach kids and hide it under the bushel. No, don't let Satan blow it out. Don't let Satan, you know, you know it's, it's such a great song. So when he was behind there, not only are you hiding the light from others, but you're not allowing it to also to come in you. And often, again, it's through people. The Holy Spirit absolutely convicts us. But, you know, to have trusted people in your life that say, you know, I've, I've noticed this, and, and you've asked for it. You know, there's, there's opportunities. So when you speak to my life, you know, I, I think... Our relationship amongst pastors, you know, it would be, hey, we have, we trust each other, we love each other, I see this in your life, um, you know, can I speak into it, because I want to pray with you, I want you to be the best you can possibly be. Absolutely, and Life Group is a great place for that, yep. there's trust, there's community, and Freedom yeah. Session is another great place. It's true. And again, um, we have to be open to receive correction, and again, that's even what the Word does. Um, the scripture talks about how the Word, it, it corrects it exhorts it, that's what it does and and so we have to be open to receive that and like you said there has to be a, a humility there to receive it and so and then when the light shines when we step into it, what the light does actually uh, when you wake up in the morning if you look at yourself in the mirror you turn on the light usually to see yourself better and the light actually exposes imperfections and flaws wow and so when we step into god's light it will do that and it's a little bit uncomfortable right um, if you have flaws, you're like, oh, I got to deal with that. But God is there. He deals with us in such a beautiful, gentle way where he forgives us. It says the scripture, if you confess your sins to God, he's faithful to forgive you of all unrighteousness. So, mm -hmm. and that's what the light does. And we are to be that light too, but we have to, again, there has to be grace and truth. So mm -hmm. we bring the truth to people by grace. And, and that's what God does to us. We got to be the same way with others. Which is, again, why Jesus came. And he, he, he understands humanity. He's yeah. been there. And he said, there's no temptation such as common to man that I haven't provided a way of escape. He's already walked through it. And he's, he's victorious. Thank you for staying with us. God bless you. Enjoy the Love rest you of your day. Oh.